Tonight, I was just going to springboard off of uh, John 17 and just share with you for a few minutes about God's will for our life. And we need to get to know that person on the inside that we really try to deny exists or ignore and allow God to change him. I remember when I had a nicotine addiction, it was for a number of years, I, and I smoked, like I said, three packs a day. But God finally released me of that when I was willing to give it to him. And then he released me of alcohol shortly after that when I was willing to give it to him. And, and you know, the Lord, Nick, the Lord will never, ever, ever stop asking for more and more territory in your life and in your heart. It's just a given. How long does it take for us to fully surrender to the Lord? A lifetime. It's a lifetime because the Holy Spirit is always desiring to take up residence in new areas of our heart and our life continually. And the moment you refuse to allow him to, well... That's not a good place to be because you will hinder what he desires to do in your life. And no one, no one, listen to me now, no one ever stays in a suspended or an arrested state of spiritual development. You're going in one direction or another. Make no mistake about that. You're either going forward or you're going back. No one stays in an arrested state. See, we want to make sure that we're doing all those things that would encourage us to continue to move forward in the Lord and our surrender and our yieldedness so he can do all that he desires to do in our heart and our life, right? Well, Jesus points out in his high priestly prayer in John 17, and maybe we should pray one more time. Can we do that? Lord, I pray that you've been speaking to me about this text in my life, and Lord, I pray that as you will, would you use this to speak to those that are here in this sanctuary, those over the internet in my hearing? Lord, we're not afraid. We're not afraid for you to show us who we really are. We're not afraid to surrender it to you, Lord. We do get concerned sometimes of what the result might be. Just like these five young men who so boldly proclaimed the beautiful gospel of salvation in Christ alone. Oh, they'll pay a price, but it will be very temporary. But whoa, the rewards are eternal. And Lord, so help us, help us to make whatever sacrifices necessary for us to continue to reach the vanishing point, Lord, to offer ourselves as a living sacrifice to you. So speak to us tonight, Lord. Speak. Your servant hears. And Lord, empower us to obey as we will, as we yield. In your holy name, amen. In John chapter 17, verse 16, Jesus states, they are not of the world. Who's that? The disciples then and those who would believe in their word after them. So that's you and I. We're in this world, but we're not of this world, right? We're in the world, but we're not of it. And that's what he's saying here. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. As you have sent me into the world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they may also be sanctified by the truth. So Jesus is saying that he wants to sanctify his followers, his disciples here, the first early disciples, as well as everyone else who follows after them and their teaching and the word that they would give. But then he says here, very interesting, he's sanctifying himself. What does that mean in, in verse 19? And for their sakes, for the disciples' sake, for our sake, he has sanctified himself, that they may be sanctified by the truth. Why was Jesus, why did, was it necessary for Jesus to sanctify himself? I can't hear you. I can, somebody said something. Was it you? To fulfill the law. Okay. Well, what does it mean that Jesus sanctified himself? Exactly right. He was being set apart. He was being consecrated. He purposed that his life would be lived for the very specific purpose for which the Father had sent him, to be a sacrifice for the world. Now, if we are to be sanctified as believers, what does that mean to us? We're to be set apart, set apart from the world. Set apart, listen to me now, listen closely, set apart from your own desires. 
set apart from your own longings, set apart from anyone else's expectation of your life, set apart to do God's will completely in your life. You've been created. You've been created for a purpose, to glorify God. And how do you glorify God? By your obedience to his word. You're set apart, you're sanctified as you're growing in your understanding of the word and then you're yielding to the same. Ezra, the scribe, began that tremendous revival after the Babylonian captivity in Israel. How did he do that? Ezra purposed to know the word of God. Ezra purposed to do the word of God. And then Ezra purposed to share the word of God. Turn with me to 1 Thessalonians for a moment. We're talking about being sanctified, being set apart, being consecrated for the purposes and the work of God. Would you like to know what his will is in sanctification for your life? Well, it's right here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's amazing how 1 and 2 Thessalonians are so apocalyptic, you know? End times focused. Oh, we've been speaking about the end times on Wednesday nights, haven't we? Yeah, and we'll continue that next Wednesday. Uh, we've been looking at proof for the dispensation of belief in a pre-tribulation rapture. We looked at all of the types last week, remember, in the Old Testament? Or not all of them, but we picked up a few of them. We'll pick up a few in the New Testament next week. And the week after, we'll look at some very specific texts that are implicit in, with regard to the doctrine of the rapture of the church. But here, knowing God's will for our life, he says in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, verse 1, Finally, brethren, we urge you and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. Oh, who was that man we talked about that reached the vanishing point? Enoch. Enoch. What's his name mean? Dedicated. His whole life was dedicated to the Lord. And Hebrews tells us, and we'll look at this again on Sunday, that he walked with God and pleased God, and he was no more. No more. God took him, right? Yeah. We should have a walk pleasing the Lord such that we are no more. What does that mean? It's no more me living my life, my desires, my wants, but the Lord allowing him to live his life through me, what he desires, what he wants. Unfortunately, too many don't want to hear that message. They want God to jump on board their program, their plans, their desires, rather than to really pray and seek the Lord and his will for their life. Hmm? Yes, for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. Verse 3. For this is the will of God. You ready? You're being set apart. You're being consecrated. Your sanctification. That first of all, that you would abstain from sexual immorality. Sexual immorality was a huge problem in that day during the early church. Aren't we glad it's not a problem today? What's new? <laughs> sexual immorality. The very powerful gift that God gave to humankind to be life-forming, life-giving, right? Where, where a man and a woman would come together in that intimacy and then, and then produce another of like kind, a child, who would hopefully be the best of each of them, right? Offering to the world, offering to God for his service, to continue to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ and the way of salvation. That's the whole purpose for marriage. Procreation is one, right? What's the second purpose? Procreation is one. I'm sorry? Serve God together, you'll find a purpose. But I think sanctification is another. <laughs> You've done a wonderful job, Carolyn, of sanctifying Ed through the person of the Holy Spirit working through you. And Ed, vice versa, right? We, we're to do that for one another, right? Yeah. Procreation, sanctification, imitation. What's the imitation? To show the world what the relationship between Christ and his church looks like. Right? Mm. Yes, that wonderful gift that God has given us in our sexuality to use in marriage. Where one biological man, one biological woman come together for the rest of their lives, committed to one another, committed to God, and to be life producing. Not, not just in babies, though, is it? No. Life producing in so many other ways, but 
So many, so, so many marriages fall far short today. Not here. Right, Ray? For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain from sexual immorality, that each one should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. It's an honorable thing, Nick, that you want to allow your body to be free from alcohol. Hmm. Hey, pray for me. I'm 71 years old, and I've had a sugar and carb addiction my entire life. Sugar and carbs? I'm sorry? Nicotine, smoking, yeah, yeah. What did you say? Did I say alcohol? Yes. Nick, you've been drinking? <laughs> Epinosis? Logo Sophia? <laughs> and where was I? Well, where was I? I was launching off into something. Yeah. Sugar and carbs. Yeah, where was sugar and carbs? My, you know, my happy place. Right? Is that true of you? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, you know, this. I mean, you. For a long time, I thought, well, this is this is not a problem. This is mild. I mean, you know, this is not. I got. It's the biggies I need to attack. Well, this is one of my biggies now. I got to get rid of the sugar and the carb addiction. Why? Because I want to take care of this vessel. I want to honor God with this vessel. I want to stay as healthy and as mentally alert as I possibly can until he takes me. I don't know how much more time I have. You know, but I pray that all the time I do have, I can use for him to honor him, to sanctify myself, set myself up. Now, I'm sure there's things in your life that you have been listening to the Holy Spirit who's been speaking to you about things that you need to change in order to honor God by taking care of the vessel. Hmm? I think it's a terrible thing when pastors, uh, you know, buffet their bodies to the extent that they're so obese and they're not displaying self-discipline to their congregation, to their followers, right? I remember when I quit drinking alcohol, 1985 is when I quit drinking. And my son was 15 years old, and I sat him down. And I said, son, I want you to understand something. From this day forward, I'm not going to drink any alcohol. I want you to know that my joy, my merriment, the pleasure of life comes from my relationship with God and you and your mother, not from a bottle, not from some substance. No, 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 no. Well, no isn't that a wonderful thing to teach our children? You know? I, I believe personally that, that, that there's no reason for a Christian to drink alcohol ever, ever. Why? You have all the medicines you need to take care of any medicinal purposes, and that's the only allowable reason why Paul gave for Timothy to take a little wine, wasn't it? For his many ailments. No, no, no. And look at the damage that alcohol has done in our society. Look at the damage. You know, alcohol is still, still the number one abused drug in the, in the world. Alcohol. So many people find their comfort, their, their release, their escape in a bottle. You wake up the next morning and your problems are still there, aren't they? <laughs> but I'll guarantee you this. When you give them to the Lord, they're no more. Cast all your cares upon me, for I care for you. And watch what I will do. Amen? Yeah. Yes, abstain from sexual enmity. You should be possessed your own vessel and sanctification and honor, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Now, these passions of lust can co cover a variety of addictions, of seeking pleasures that are not appropriate for you in your body, your life. What might they be? Tell me, give me some examples. Passions of lust. <sighs> Anthony, Anthony, I gotta be, Anthony and I and Rob got to be really careful. We have a Saturday morning routine. We go to the gym every Saturday morning. Not the kind of gym you're thinking about. A long while ago, I had to tell him, text me, we're going to the gym. But Gail would read my text. The gym is the donut shop. <laughs> so, so we got, you know, that's, that's a passion of lust, isn't it? Right? If you ever want to have a, a good time, go to the donut shop early in the morning and sit there and, isn't it true, watch people come in and how excited they are, how giddy they are, even adults, over getting donuts, you know? 
They'll, they'll get down and put their nose right to the glass. Right? Remember that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, we saw this big couple come in, and they, oh, man, they were just so excited. I mean, they're all over with joy. And, and they got two big boxes of donuts, and we thought, well, they're going to have a party. After we left, they were in the car eating the donuts. <laughs> you know, it's that happy place for them, right? <laughs> but, but that can be abused, can it? God gave us food to enjoy, but not to kill ourselves. You know, the American society, right? Alcohol, drugs, food, <laughs> sugar, carbs. Ooh, you ever get a carb coma? Anybody ever have a carb coma? Come on, you have. Well, you had so many carbs where you're, you're kind of got a brain fog. Ever happened to you? You're lying. Now, I know you're all lying, you know? <laughs> yeah, I know Levi has, you know? He's a, he's a six donut man in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> so these passions of lust it's, it's, just not, it's just not sexual immorality it can be a variety of things name me something else I confessed I said donuts okay money ice cream, money, ice cream. oh wait a minute leave ice cream alone <laughs> ice cream sure <laughs> what is it exercise. exercise can be an addiction if you have the wrong motivation if your motivation is to have this, this, this hot body, right? Then it's the wrong motivation. I remember when I was a young man, I'd be in the gym five days a week. I ran six. I was in the gym five. I looked nothing like I look now, but it was all about my opinion. And then all weekend long, I'd go and blow everything I worked out for. Why? How? Right. What do you call that, Mike? I better go on, right? Yeah. Alcohol. What else? Success. Oh, how do you measure success? Jeremiah prophesied for 40 years. Major prophet, the extent of his writing. 40 years. How many converts? One. My goodness. Joel Osteen could teach him much about success. Largest church in America, Joel Osteen. Joel Osteen successful in God's eyes? Now, if you read the Bible, if you read and understand the Bible and a minister's mission, purpose, he has not been successful in any way, not according to biblical standard. Was Jeremiah successful? One convert, 40 years. Why was he successful? Because he did the will of he, and Success is simply obeying, obeying the Lord. So many people think that because God has prospered you economically or grown your business or made you the, given you the ability to gain wealth that you have his pleasure. Mm -mm, not so. So many people think today that if you any, have any problems or tribulations in your life, you must be out of the will of God. Well, explain that to the Apostle Paul. In his list of sufferings that was not complete in any way, yet I don't think any man had ever suffered more than he did for the cause of Christ. Completely in God's will. Hmm? Hmm. Not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. That no one should take advantage of or defraud his brother in this manner because the Lord is the avenger of all such. As we also forewarned you and testified, no one would take advantage of anybody else using the name of the Lord, would they? Hmm? I came down here from New York, right? Albany, New York is where I'm from. Albany, New York. You know what their claim to fame is with regard to bibliology? It is the most biblically illiterate city in the country. Albany, New York, capital of, the, of New York State. Most biblically illiterate city in the country. We had a bar or a strip joint, a gentleman's club, so, <laughs> not a bad name, on every corner. Then I came here, hallelujah, hallelujah, to the promised land. And you got a church on every corner, right? Isn't that true? Yeah, but such hypocrisy. Isn't that true? Yeah. Oh, my. What is he saying here? No one should defraud their brother. Everybody who ran around had the little fish on the back of their bumper. I can't tell you how many contractors I hired, how many people I did business with. Who, and I did business because they'd have the fish or they'd have the cross on their business card or on their bumper. And, and, then, and then they defrauded me. They cheated me. They took the money and ran. What is that about? Be careful. You know, if you have to wear it on your shirt or put it on a business card or slap it on your bumper, chances are you're not. 
How should they know that I'm a Christian? By my actions, by my love, by my conduct. I remember I was going shopping to the Christian bookstore here in town several years ago, and that's when the bracelets, those uh, WWJD bracelets, what did they mean, WWJD? What would Jesus do? That's when, that was very popular. And so I'm going down through the parking lot, and this guy gets in his car, and he's in such a hurry, doesn't even look, puts it in reverse, bam, slams right into my car. I got out, you know, I was, I was trying to be polite and diplomatic about the whole thing, you know? I didn't have him pressed against the glass for too long. No, no, but, <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I said, well, you know, can I see your insurance card and driver's license? He didn't have his driver's license. I said, well, just stay in your car. And I'm not going to move mine because I had him pinned. And I said, I'm just going to call the police. Oh, he went ballistic on me. You know, his head exploded. I didn't know who the man was. But he was a business owner. And he ran into the Christian bookstore to get a bunch of these WWJD bracelets. And he's cursing me up and down because I'm calling the police to report the accident. You know? <laughs> I found that quite hypocritical. <laughs> right? Wouldn't you think? <laughs> I remember I bought a brand new car and I'm in the GE parking lot. And the same thing happened. And, and, and <laughs> I'm going down the parking lot. And you've got to be careful in parking lots. This guy throws his car in reverse, doesn't even look. Bam. Brand new car. Just got had it a week. He gets out of his car, and I get out of my car. I'm laughing. And he's shocked. He said, what are you laughing about? I said, thank God you freed me. It's not new anymore. I don't have to park 60 yards away, you know? <laughs> he thought that was crazy. <laughs> yeah. No one should take advantage. I've had to ask people to leave the fellowship who've taken advantage of people in the fellowship. If I find out about it, I'm going to deal with it. If I find out about it, you're going to make it right, or you're going to go. And that's happened, unfortunately, you know, where people have been taken advantage of here. And I've had to tell people, either you make it right, and you make it right now, or you leave. Rather than make it right, what do they do? They leave. Why? How cheaply people sell their soul. Hmm? For God did not call us unto uncleanness, but to holiness. Therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man, but God, who also has given us the Holy Spirit. All right, so how do we flesh this out, really? What are these idols that we put into our life where we don't want to come face to face with that man on the inside who God wants to change? Because we know that sanctification, that change happens from the inside out, doesn't it? Turn with me to Galatians chapter 5. We're all familiar with this. Galatians 5. I'm taking more time than I wanted to. I wanted to give you more time for meditation, reflection. Let me go through this quickly. Galatians chapter 5. Let's look beginning in verse 16. I say then, who's speaking? Paul. Paul to the Galatians. Who's really speaking? The Holy Spirit. I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Your walk of life. It means, who are you? Your way of life. Walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, be in the Spirit, and you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the lusts of the flesh, excuse me, the flesh lusts against the Spirit, the Spirit against the flesh, and these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish to do. Now, as Christians, you, you can have a walk in the flesh again, can't you? The problem with that is you're absolutely wretched. You're miserable. You know, before I was saved, I was very happy in my sin, causing me problems, and there were times where I wasn't happy about it. But, well, oh boy, sure, I liked my sinful pleasures until I got saved. Then I had too much of the Holy Spirit to be happy with sin or the world any longer. But I did discover that if I, as I allowed the world to continue to be in my life, I had too much of the world to be happy with the Holy Spirit. And, and listen, you'll meet Christians who are like that. You know how you, how you can first tell that's happening? They're miserable. They're miserable. They've got a sour look on their face all the time. They're not happy. There's no joy in their life. You know why? Why? Because they've got too much of the Holy Spirit to be happy in the world, too much of the world to be happy with the Holy Spirit anymore. And it's sad. And they're always comfortable pointing out their sin, but in somebody else's life. <laughs> right? Yeah. 
So listen, I, I'm sure I'm not speaking to any of you, but I thought maybe there's somebody over the internet listening tonight who needs to hear this. There's no joyous, happier place to be than completely in the will of God for your life. There's such freedom in that, isn't it, dear? You're free like a bird. Hmm? And that's where you want to be, and that's what Paul's admonition is here. Look at the rest of the text. For if you're led by the Spirit, you're not under the law. Praise God. The law was for sinners, right? Paul made that clear in Romans. The law was for sinners, such as us. We were one day, right? Why did the Holy Spirit come? To convict of sin. Righteousness. God's righteousness. The righteousness of Christ that we can have that opportunity to be clothed in. And the judgment to come. Yeah. Fourth of July, I went up to my sons. Had a wonderful time to share with this young man. The true gospel. Been in church his whole life. And, you know, uh, unfortunately, I think uh, his parents and he, they just have religion. They don't have a relationship with the Lord. When did you become born again? I, I, I'm not born again. And he'd always talk of born again folks and people who are born again and believe in Jesus and follow the scriptures as, you know, those kind of people, you know, those people, you know. Well, I'm one of those people. <laughs> let me tell you about that. And let me tell you the joy and the peace of contentment you can enter your heart and your soul by being one of those people. Hmm? No, if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Works speaks of labor, right? Anybody work out in the sun today? Ooh, I did some work outside today. Oh, mama mia, right, Mike? It was hot. It was sucking the life right out of me. I don't care how much Gatorade I drank. You know, I couldn't recover. Listen, that's what sin does. It sucks all of the real life out of you. Yeah. I texted a young man earlier this week that I know. He's running. I said, why? Stop running from the only true love and joy and peace that there is in this world full of hate and contentions and bitterness and sorrow. Stop running. Yield. Surrender. It's the only sane thing to do, isn't it? Yeah. Work, labor, sweat, toil. You know, every time I read this, you know what I think of? My days in the GE factory when I first started as a young man working at the extrusion press. Do you know what an extrusion press is? You take this, these bars of steel, about so big, and they're very long, and you cut them up to a certain length. And then you heat them up in, a, in this induction heater where they're heated red hot, almost liquid. And then you take them with these tongs and you, and you put them in this press. But before you put them in the press, you have to put this, this, this molly called this liquid, this, this black material. It's not liquid, but it's like a gel. And you coat that and you put it in the press and you hit, boom, and it extrudes all of that metal through a form, and they make the blades that are on these rotors. You ever want to see a jet engine with all these blades on it? Well, that's how you make those blades. And after eight hours of that, you know, you're just, you're, you're, and the sweat just pours off you. It is so hot, and you're so filthy, and you got this stuff from head to toe all over you, and that's labor. The flesh, and it's labor. Dirty, stinky, hot, miserable. Oh, I was so glad to get off that job. You know. Yeah, the works of the flesh are evident. Which of these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousy, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you before, and just as I told you in times past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Is that plain? Pretty plain. What is it saying? Individuals whose lives are characterized by that stinky labor of the flesh. That's what their life is characterized by. Can't, you can't go to heaven. Why? You're still in your sin. You haven't experienced the righteousness of Christ. You see. Oh. The, the, the world thinks what we believe now is, is so judgmental, so condemning, so harsh. 
so narrow-minded, so divisive. No. It's just the opposite. What we believe and what we're trying to tell them will set them free from a life of pain and sorrow, from the filth of this labor of sin. Mm. Now we get to the good part. Verse 22. Now we get to the will of God. Your sanctification, the purpose for which God has called each of us to him is to display the fruit of the Spirit. What do you have to do? How much labor do you have to do to produce the fruit of the Spirit? Just abide in the Lord. You don't have to do any labor at all. Hmm. You just relax, enjoy the Lord, and watch him work. But the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace. That speaks of our relationship to God the Father. We've talked about this before. The only true love comes from God himself. And so these attributes of the fruit of the Spirit can only be accomplished in and through our relationship with God. The next three, as you know, and we've been through this so many times before, but you know what? You can know it and not live it. You need to live it. John eleven twenty six 26 says, for those who live in Christ, live in and believe in. It's not just believing in. You can believe all these things, but not live there. Noah wasn't saved because he built the ark. Noah wasn't saved because he put the pitch on the ark. Noah wasn't saved because he decorated the ark, put a name on the ark. Noah was saved because of what? He got in, he got in the ark. <laughs> you got in. You got to be in Jesus. And this is where you live. This is where you, you're in Jesus. And therefore, your life produces love, joy, and peace. Now in our relationship with others, it should be other-centered. It's not about me anymore, but it's about Christ living his life in me for the benefit of others, long-suffering, kindness, and goodness. That speaks of my relationship to my dear wife and everyone else in my life. And then the last three, true Christian joy, right? Jesus, others, and who's last? You. Y'all, right? Then the last three deal with our relationship to ourself. Kindness, goodness, and, excuse me, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Again, such there is no law. Hmm. The works of the flesh, they're evident, Paul says. It's obvious. It's no mystery. Tonight, your opportunity to offer him whatever works of the flesh may still be existing in your life. How long does it take to make the change that God wants to make in our life? A lifetime. So listen, don't lie to yourself. Don't lie to God. You're not going to lie to me. There are things that you need to let go of tonight. Every one of us here. And there are things you will always need to let go of when we come to communion. We come before the Lord. Because we're still in this sinful body. We still carry around this dead carcass. And it's still tempted by the things of this world, by the things of the flesh, by the devil himself. And so we need to resist those and have the strength in our communion with the Lord to be set free. You're right. He said <laughs> and so, so tonight's your opportunity. The most worshipful thing we do happens every first Wednesday of the month. The most worshipful thing we do is come before God and offer ourselves to him as a living sacrifice, a burnt offering. As he was the burnt offering for the world, we're a burnt offering for Christ. Amen? So uh, I think the plan is Ryan's going to play some instrumental music. And as he does, we can come forward. We still have plenty of time. It's only 8.01. I want you to be reflective. I want you to be, be sincere about this. I don't want you to take it in a flippant manner. I want to be, and look at it. If there's some, listen to me. Now listen to me. Nobody's going to listen. Nobody's going to take notice. Nobody's going to look at you. Everybody should just be focused on their relationship with the Lord. And if there's something in your life you don't want to let go of, then don't come forward. Why am I warning you about that? Because the Apostle Paul warns us and it says, if you come forward at this communion and you do it in an unworthy manner, you eat and drink judgment upon yourself. God will judge you for it. Why? Not, listen, he's not in these elements. We don't believe in transubstantiation where the wine, be, uh, the, it's not wine, it's juice, where the juice becomes his blood and the, and the host of these little wafers become his body. We don't believe that. There are, there are people that believe that erroneously to be kept under the thumb of that 
institution. We know that all of this is symbolic of his blood shed, his body broken for us. And so if you dishonor that sacrifice, you're judging yourself. You don't want to do that. Better you don't take it. I'll be honest with you, there are times in my life where I didn't take communion because my heart wasn't right. I remember distinctly the time I was angry with God, very mad at God. And, and I, I, I couldn't come at that time. He was right, I was wrong. I just had to get to that point where I realized that. But then I was set free. So tonight, if that's you, then just sit there. But I implore you, beg you, beseech you, let it all down. Give God everything. He has nothing but your highest and best is mine. You'll never, ever, ever love God as much as he loves you. You'll never, ever, ever desire heaven more than he wants you to be there. Isn't that glory? Isn't that a wonderful thought? That he wants me there more than I want to be there? Because I know how bad I want to be there. You know? <laughs> Amen? Well, let's pray. Lord, you said it's the cup of blessing. It's the bread of life. And Lord, we don't want to take this cup and, and, and participate in this bread, Lord, in an unworthy manner. But Lord, we ask you once again, would you speak to our hearts, Lord? What, whatever, it is, whatever it is we need to lay down, whatever it is we need to offer to you tonight, Lord, help us to offer it to you. It is you who works within us both to will and to do. So Lord, we want to serve you. We want to love you more than we ever have, Lord. We'll never love you as much as you love us. But Lord, help us to love you more. Help us to give you more. Help us to surrender more. And help us to live a life that pleases you, Lord, and brings you glory so that we fulfill our purpose, that we are sanctified, that we're set apart, that we're consecrated for your work, Lord. And simply your work is to be your representatives out there in this lost and dying world, this dark, unloving place. Let us shed light and love everywhere we go. Light and love and your life. In Jesus' name, amen.